Material, part of NWA. On tonight's NWA, Bazza from Brookie meets Ken from Corrie, and the night the Sex Pistols came to town. It certainly changed my life. It made me think in a completely different way. June the 4th, 1976, and the Sex Pistols, a little-known band of ragar street urchins from down south, turn up to play a gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall in Manchester. Not Liverpool, but Manchester. That gig changed forever, not only the lives of the 100 people who turned up, but the 500 people who said they turned up. A month later, the Pistols were back, this time with local band Buzzcocks in tow. So what exactly was it about those two lo-fi concerts in the backwaters of showbiz that changed forever not only the future sound of Manchester, but the course of Western civilization? To find out, come back with me now to the summer of 76, when, as I recall, Abba were number one, and my mate Moe was sitting by a canal bank. Seventy-six in Manchester was a very, very hot, boring summer. Can you hear the drums, Fernando? There's nothing happening. He got the odd concert now and again, but it's mainly mainstream bands. I'll tell you how boring it was, how sad it was. We got barred from pubs in the centre of Manchester for having long hair. It was really boring. Until, I suppose, the Sex Pistols played. I am an Antichrist. I am an Antichrist. No one ever bad. This rare footage shows the Sex Pistols on stage at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. They've been booked by local student Howard Devoto. To this day, a deeply enigmatic person. He agreed to be interviewed for this film as long as his face wasn't shown. In Manchester, in the north of England, around the middle of 1976, there were two concerts featuring a group that were fast becoming very famous called the Sex Pistols. Howard was a guy, I think, that picked up on a small article in the NME about the Sex Pistols and how dreadful they were. The Sex Pistols and I was surprised when a hundred people turned up at the Lesser Free Trade Hall. June the 4th, 76, 50 pence, that is, value for money. We'd just never seen anything like it. It was just unbelievable. We didn't know what it was. It was just something that you couldn't, you couldn't take in. And it sounded absolutely awful. I think that was part of what we liked about it, because it's kind of like this punk thing. It was like saying, throw all the rule books out the window and just be yourself, and yourself will be, you know, all you need. This wasn't a punk gig. The, you know, the idea of punk gigs, we all went to punk gigs, bogoing, gobbing, loads of people banging off each other. This wasn't a punk gig, this wasn't a gig, this was a band on a proscenium arch stage, a small, strange, dull, wooden auditorium with 100 of 120 seats, with 35 people sitting separately, I think most people were on their own, sitting separately in a seat, staring at this thing. The audience were just like us, really, hippies, and when the Sex Pistols came on stage, we, they looked completely different from us. Everybody who was there were kind of outsiders, and that was what had drawn them there. That's why people were there, and the Sex Pistols were the ultimate outsiders group. And you knew it just, it was just all gelled. It, there was instant identification with the Sex Pistols. You were never looking to um, hopefully see a good rock and roll band. You were looking and hoping to see the most dreadful and, and, and wonderful um, energy that could be best described as, you know, your first fuck, really. To me, being 15, I mean, uh, I suppose it was sort of like a Take That fan, the way I saw him. To me, he was gorgeous. The way he sang was just like so energetic. There was just an anger there, the, the way he looked, that it was just like amazing. The most thing I remember about him was his staring eyes. He used to stare into the audience. 
And when it had finished, it seemed all too soon, um, we just looked at each other and said, we want to be in a group. So Bernard had a guitar, and I went out the very next day and bought a £35 SG copy from Maisel's on Oxford Road. Well, I only went to the first one, the first one at Free Trade Hall, that's just before Buzzcocks were formed. And I stood outside, went to meet this guy to form a group. And the next thing I'm talking to Malcolm McLaren. Uh, uh, I think his name was Diggle. Took me inside and introduced me to Pete, who was collecting tickets on the door, you know. He uh, seemed such an innocent sort of chap, really. <laughs> and he came up to me and said, so, here's your new bass player. Yeah. Which I was quite <laughs> surprised, which was nice. The first thing Malcolm said after it was, we'll do it again, we want to do it again. And I set up another gig. This was on the 20th of July. By this time, Buzzcocks were ready, and 400 instead of 100 people were also ready to attend. We were asked to return <laughs> a second time and play with the so-called group, which I think Howard called the Buzzcocks. Obviously, I'd never heard of the Buzzcocks. It was their first gig. Um, uh, I remember that they, they were first on. I remember them being really dreadful. Well, the Buzzcocks were great. I saw part of the I can't remember whether I stayed for it all, so I wanted to go to the pub. <laughs> I couldn't really play the bass, I just sort of went along with it really, you know. And in true punk to this one. How Devoto ended the set by pulling out Pete Shelley's guitar at the end of boredom, I think they finished up with. And it was the first time I've seen a Buzzcocks, and I was like really like, wow, kind of knocked out, you know, that there was at least another band along the same lines as us. Boredom. Um, the Pistols came on and by this time the scene had grown so much in the month or whatever it was like really like an avalanche. So we knew more or less what to expect and we were very hyped up for it. It was also the first time we premiered Anarchy I think, the second gig. And the curtains opened and uh, uh, Johnny Rotten started to sing and the rest of the band hadn't even got the instruments plugged in. And there were some expletives chucked across the stage, you know, I mean, hang on a fucking minute or something, you know. I left after about six numbers, I think it was. We got into the spirit of things, and after they finished one song, I shouted out, I can do that, and Johnny Rotten came forward, walked to the edge of the stage, and looked in my direction. There was nobody else sat around us. And he said, who's the with the mouth? And I just sort of froze, gulped, and slid into my seat. I was scared. They played in the way that, as if they just didn't care. Mm. Couldn't care less whether you liked us or not, mm. really. Which was, uh, Which was quite good, I enjoyed yeah. that. Because we didn't really care either. As an outsider, it would look like, as though it had quite a sort of important cathartic effect on it. Um, but it's the same wherever we played. It, there was like a real watershed, like pre-pistols and after pistols. It was this fulcrum moment which transformed us from being an ordinary British city with, you know, a couple of good bands every two or three years to being this, um, this bloody battery farm of geniuses, which just does not stop. We keep thinking it's going to stop and it doesn't. It became like, wow, that's what we want to do. We wanted to become punks, which we did. And it was... Um, it was a fine moment. I mean, it certainly changed my life. It made me think in a completely different way. There'd have been no Joy Division, no Factory Records, no Hacienda, no Smiths, no Simply Red, even down, down to that far. That Sex Pistols concert changed everything. This summer, with Punk 20 years old and the Pistols back together, we reunited their Manchester audience in the original venue. You see, I think we just turned up on the night just out of our heads, and uh, I think these were tickets that they had on the door. I was a afro haired moustache soul boy, and we still came to see the pistols, and it's not because they were our mates, it's not yeah. and dogs and everything. Yeah. Donald with his Lorex trousers. This weekend, the Free Trade Hall closed for good, though the Sex Pistols themselves play on. The pistols reforming has surprised me greatly because I know John quite well. Um, and his hatred for Glenn Matlock. I just obviously didn't realise his love of money was more than his hatred for Glenn Matlock. I think it's a, a farce. And I wouldn't go and see them if you paid me. It's sad because of what they were standing for at the time. And I'm sure the young Sex Pistols wouldn't approve of what the old Sex Pistols are doing. I, I don't know where we're playing, to be honest. I'm just going to turn up and clean pair of socks and that's it. Love you! 
mean, I for one, when I heard it, was surprised and I thought, oh, rubbish. And then when I sat down and thought about it, I thought, I'm going and I will be there. I couldn't, I wouldn't miss it for the world. If it gives me something back from that moment of, which is a very, very important moment in my life, one spark, it reminds me of that time, then it'll all be worthwhile. I can only remember that those kids were um, believing that they were at the beginning of something. Um, and they believed they had in their reach something authentic and they were not going to ever let that go. It was a rare jewel, like a ruby in a field of tin. I think a combination of the Sex Pistols playing twice plus Buzzcocks being a Manchester band very obviously galvanised something or other. But then it's all gone. And it's sort of, well, what happens next? We thought punk was going to change the world. We grew up to be postmen, greengrocers and smarmy TV hosts. Uh, that's me, obviously, and not the blessed Anthony H. The Sex Pistols remembered. Right, stay with us, because after the break we get the lowdown on Soap City as Barry from Brookside comes clean. Don't go changing. <laughs> 